My experience with semiplumab has been quite extensive, not only now that it's been FDA approved, but I was one of the investigators in the phase two study that helped to get this drug FDA approved. And so I've been able to watch patients go from having socked in horrible disease or metastatic disease to having disease that's now regressed, controllable, and some patients will have complete resolution of their disease. Some patients will have their disease shrink up and almost become inactivated where they'll continue to have disease on their scans and they'll just never progress. And many times you can even, you have to make a decision to take people off whether they've just had enough because we don't know how much is enough or they develop toxicity and we decide it's time to take them off but those responses really remain consistently stable. The toxicities with semiplumab are very similar to the toxicities that we see with other anti-PD-1 agents. Um, there's fatigue, there's rash, there's itching. Uh, you might have a little bit of diarrhea in a small percentage of patients. Um, this drug also gets metabolized through the liver and the kidneys, so we worry about drug-induced hepatitis, drug-induced nephritis. Um, sometimes patients will also get a little bit of hypothyroidism, um, but again, that's easily managed with giving the patients levothyroxine for replacement. Um, the endocrinopathies in general that occur secondary to anti-PD-1 therapy appear to be the adverse events that happen that appear to be lifelong. So patients need to understand that if they do develop an endocrinopathy, the treatment of those endocrinopathies would be required for the rest of their life. Um, all of the other toxicities that we see are, for all intents and purposes, treatable and resolvable. So how do we pick patients who are candidates for immunotherapy? Well, I think the key is really a good history. You really wanna make sure that patients don't have any horrific autoimmune underlying diseases um, because whenever you give any type of immunotherapy, you've gotta know that you're going to exacerbate that underlying disease. So if I have a patient who has really uncontrolled um, ulcerative colitis, I have to think long and hard about whether or not patients like that would get this drug. However, you need to have the conversation with the patient just because they have underlying autoimmune diseases or underlying colitis doesn't mean that it's a knee-jerk response of, oh no, you can't get this drug. You have to talk about risk to benefit. You've got someone who's got diffusely metastatic disease and is gonna die from their disease you have to weigh out what's the risk of giving them some toxicity that may require tweaking their underlying meds or you know, really watching them very closely to make sure they don't either get diarrhea or a flare of their arthritis because they have RA. Uh, most people in general, when they weigh out dying from cancer versus dealing with toxicity from drugs, will sit down and say, I think we should give it a chance because they understand that although they might have an exacerbation of their underlying disease or their underlying symptoms of their disease, there's always the hope that they are gonna develop that long-term response and durability of response where they can come off these drugs and still remain alive with their cancer essentially under control.